join me on our next adventure into the wonderful world of lighting design. Let's start first with a basic question. What is the primary purpose of lighting design in the theater? If you said something like, to help tell the story, then you'd be close. I'd say that's the second reason for theatrical lighting design. The number one purpose is to see the performers. Yes, to see our performers, because if you can't see the actors, then there's no reason for an audience to be here. Also, we have a term for theater without lights. It's called radio. So, with the knowledge that our first job as lighting designers is to illuminate our actors well enough for them to be seen and heard, and by the way, your ability to accurately hear things is directly affected by how well you can see your source and vice versa. This is why you or your parents turn down the radio in the car when you're looking for a new address. But anyway, let's push on to some concepts of lights, lighting design as a whole. First, let's look at the nine controllable properties of light and theater. Intensity, color, distribution, direction, movement, shape, texture, diffuseness, and atmosphere. Intensity we've gone over before. It's how bright the light is, but also how bright or dim it is in comparison with other things on stage. Is it the brightest light on stage? If so, why? Is it highlighting something? Intensity is the primary means of making sure our actors are both visible and can be heard. Color is also an obvious one. Through gel or LED technology, we can control exactly what color the light is that is shining on the actor or set or prop or whatever. We make a choice for every light that we use to be a specific color for a specific reason. Why is that light a blue while this light is a soft pink? Through the mixing of colors, we can create new colors on stage. Remember how in front lighting, that uses two lights per acting area, we use a pink and a blue to mix into a white light? Distribution is the first one that is less obvious. Distribution refers to how light is spread across the scene. Is the full stage lit brightly? Is the scene very narrowly lit and focused down to a single person? The feeling of each of these is drastically different and should be considered carefully. Direction falls into a similar vein. Is the subject primarily lit from the front, the side, the back, or underneath? Each of these carries different weight and purpose and should have an intention behind them. Movement refers to the rate of change between two cues, not just the literal movement of moving lights swinging around on stage, though it is included in the idea of movement. Do the cues snap between them? Is it a slow fade? What are the benefits to one over the other? An instant blackout carries a sense of finality that a slow fade to black does not. The slow fade can imply a sense of hope or continuation that a snap blackout can't achieve. Shape means the shape of the light, not counting gobos or other stencils. How round or not round is the pool of light? Ellipsoidals can also have parts of those circular pools of light shuttered off to make half circles, quarter circles, and other non-round shapes. Texture now is referring to gobos and other media that cast a literal shape or text-based image of light and shadow. Through gobos we can apply light coming through windows or trees, we can make suggestions of neon signs, we can throw text on walls as reinforcements of ideas. Diffuseness is how sharp and defined, or soft and feathered, the edge of the light is. Is this pool of light ultra-defined or more subtle? Ellipsoidals have an adjustable diffuseness to their edge, while Fresnels are inherently diffuse. This also overlaps with texture because we can make that image of a window super defined, or we can take the light coming through the trees and make it soft and fuzzy like you'd find on a hazy day. Lastly, we have atmosphere, which refers to fog, smoke, or haze in the air. Light normally is not visible while in the air. It needs something to reflect off of to be seen. So by putting particulate in the air, we can see the beams of light passing through the air, which can be a great effect for dance or concert lighting, or can help direct the eye since we now have lines in the air pointing at someone or something. Haze in the air, in my opinion, allows for lighting to help fill the air above the set and actors, and often in musicals, without using haze, the stage can feel empty. Musicals have a scale to them that both allows and needs the air itself to be filled with the energy that haze and light can help provide. We can use those nine controllable properties of light to form the five general functions of light. Selective visibility, revelation of form, an illusion of nature, composition, and mood. Let's start with selective visibility. Selective visibility means that we as lighting designers are in effect the ones that have the power to tell our audience where to look and where not to look. In film and TV, they have cameras that dictate what is and isn't in the frame. They have explicit control over what the audience can see. In theater, we don't have that luxury, so we, through different means, must show the audience where to look, or to make them look away from what we want to hide. 
Intensity is our strongest method of directing the audience's eye. They will look at the brightest thing on stage usually and not look at the darkest. So we make the focus brighter than everything else. Color is the next biggest method of direction, depending on the context. We can use contrasting colors to make the focus stand out against a background or make everything else blend into the background so that our focus stands out by process of elimination. Direction in conjunction with haze is also a very powerful tool for directing the audience. Revelation of form refers to light giving dimension to objects or making them look flat. Here, intensity, color, and direction have the largest impacts on the revelation of form of an object. Direction is probably the easiest to think of first. Let's focus on Psylite. The purpose of Psylite is to highlight the shape of the performer's body by placing a highlight along the edge of their body from head to toe. The same is true of Psylighting a set piece. Watching the intensity of the light fall off along the object as it goes from highlighted edge to shadowed surface shows the contours of it that it would be lost if lit only from the front. That can be used in conjunction with color. We can use color as that highlight and another color as the shadow. Intensity also plays a heavy hand. If you bombard the object with intense side light, you can wash out the shadows, leaving no room for gradated shadows. Illusions of nature deal with suggesting that we are places that we really aren't. Color and texture are the major players here. Through color, we can suggest times of year and general location. Soft, cool blues and whites are reminiscent of icy winter months, warm ambers of desert heat and summer swelters, dappled greens of forest growth. Through texture, we can implicate light streaming through trees, reflecting off of streams, light passing through clouds and in between tree trunks. Composition is the first ethereal concept of the functions. Composition refers to the aesthetically pleasing arrangement of what we're looking at. Or to put it succinctly, does it look balanced? Or if it is unbalanced, is there a reason? If we're focusing on one person, is the sole thing illuminated on stage in a sea of darkness? Or is it better for them to be a highlight within a subdued background of color? Mood is the other ethereal concept of the functions. Mood refers to how the scene looks and makes people feel. Does it look happy? Sad? Mysterious? Suspicious? Intensity, direction, and color probably have the greatest lending to strengthen mood. A dim scene carries a different weight than a bright scene. Lighting an actor only from behind, leaving a mysterious silhouette to look at is much different than someone lit on every angle. A room bathed in red light creates the anticipation of violence that standard white lighting does not. Okay, that's a lot of conceptual stuff. Let's take a detour into measurable things that are more concrete. Firstly, we're going to look at the shape of light as it exits an ellipsoidal reflector spotlight, and why that matters. We talked briefly in a previous video about how the ellipsoidal shaped reflector inverts the light on all axes as it exits a light. That's because an ellipse has two focal points. A straight line that comes from one focal point and hits a wall must reflect and pass through the other. So if we imagine that the lamp, the light source, exists at the first focal point and emits light that hits the reflector, it will always pass through the second focal point. But where is that focal point, you may be asking? And the answer is that it changes depending on the lens of the light. The lenses can push and pull the secondary focal point, which will in turn make the light a very narrow cone or very wide one. We refer to this as the angle of the light. On a Source 4, you will have seen labels on their lens tubes that have a number on them in degrees, such as 19 degree, 26 degree, 36 degree, 50 degree, and so on. The degree notation says that the light exiting the lens is at this angle. The smaller the angle, the farther away the secondary focal point is. Next, I talked briefly in a previous video about how lighting designers divide the stage into areas to point lights at, and the reason for that is twofold. Firstly, it allows us to have a much higher degree of control over how much of the stage is lit at a single time. We can narrow the focus down very tightly or have the full stage lit at once. The second is it allows us to decide which lights to use in each area so that each area is sufficiently bright in order to see faces. What I mean by this is that if you had a standard source for with a 19 degree lens tube on it next to another one with a 26 degree lens tube on it that are both on and aimed at the same surface the same distance away, the area of the 19 degree will appear brighter. This is because each light is putting out the same amount of light, but the lens tubes are spreading them differently. The 19 degree is spreading the same amount of light over a smaller area than the 26 degree, so it will be brighter. 
While dividing the stage into areas, most people use circles that are between 8 and 10 feet in diameter as the size of each area that overlap by about a third so that people have a smooth transition while walking from one area to the next without popping in and out of a harsh source of light. To know what lights we need to use, we need two more bits of information. Where we're hanging the lights and how far away that is. We already know that the ideal angle from face to light is 45 degrees, and that alone makes this first bit of information easy to find, and the second is also very easy. If we know how high where we hang front lights are, let's say 20 feet, then we know that the lights must also be 20 feet away. This is because we can think of the relation between the actor and the light as a triangle. If it's 45 degrees up, then that means that this is a 45-45-90 triangle, which has two equal sides. So the 20 feet up must have a 20 foot distance between the actor and the light. And thanks to our friend Pythagoras, we can easily find that the distance the light travels, the hypotenuse, is a little more than 28 feet. Lastly, each lens tube designation of degree has something attached to it called a multiplication factor. If you multiply this number by the distance the light travels, that hypotenuse, you'll find the diameter of the light at that distance. So, we can do easy calculator math multiplying that 28 feet by the different multiplication factors until we find the one that is closest to our ideal 8 feet. Once we found that first one, the rest should be the same, so we only have to do the math once. Also, I did the math for us. A 19 degree source 4 would give us a pool of light that's slightly larger than 8 feet, but I prefer to use a 26 degree source 4 at this distance so that the slightly larger pool, around 12 feet, will help with the overlapping of areas to help with that smooth transition. Ooh man, that was a lot of hard facts too. Let's pull back a bit now that we have most of the tools of lighting design and look at what the process usually looks like from start to finish. Step 1, like the other designers, is to read the script. But at this stage, just read it and enjoy it. Don't try and do any work yet. Just read it to understand the story, the characters, and the plot so it all makes sense in your mind. The next step is to do research. Look at the playwright and what their life was like, the time period it was written in, the time period it was set in, the location or locations, and other pertinent information. This sort of research is helpful to understanding the context of the play and its subtext. It'll help us make decisions on color palettes that may or may not be influenced by regions. We know what sort of light source would be present indoors or if the sun was the only source of light at the time, and other small cues that would make for a tight knit design. Next, we would read the script a second time, this time making notes of interior versus exterior scenes, time of day, time of year, any practical light sources on stage like lamps or wall sconces and other things that are visible and interacted with by actors, or other very obvious things that pertain to lighting in the text or dialogue like mentionings of lightning or if the power of the house goes out or something like that. Now it's a smart idea to make a list of all of the systems of light that we need. And by systems, I mean all of the different tasks we need to accomplish with light. The basics that most every play will need are that you need a system of front lighting in warm and cool colors if you don't have LED lights. Top light, also in warm and cool colors if you don't have LED lights. Side light. Backlight. Gobos or texture washes. Practicals. And specials. Once you have your list of all the needs that you need to accomplish with light, including a defined list of each practical and each special, we can move on to the last planning step, making the light plot. To make the light plot, we have two options available to us, paper hand drafting or electronic drafting. I prefer electronic, since it's more precise and doesn't smudge, so that's what I'll go over, though paper is much the same aside from using a stencil to trace lighting symbols on paper as opposed to having a program that can make lighting symbols at a click. With light plots, space and inventory is at a premium, so we need to prioritize systems. Different theaters will have different quantities of their light, and it's never enough because lighting designers always want more for more fun, so we have to pull back to be mindful of what we have available. Prioritizing lights for different purposes tend to follow the following hierarchy for ellipsoidals. Front light, then side light, then texture and specials. For Fresnels or wash fixtures, it usually goes top light, then backlight. All right, we're going to watch me recreate the current lighting setup in the Met using Vectorworks. The first thing I'll do here is set up the subdivision of the stage into my acting areas, which are eight foot circles that are going to be evenly distributed around the theater. 
I made a bunch of them really quickly. Then here I am just kind of spacing them out evenly, making sure everything's in straight lines, except for what's at the edge of the stage because that's a curve. So I kind of match that curve. And then I'm gonna place in my front lights, which are source for it in the LED variety. And I'm gonna add in the top lights, which are also LED source fours. One per area, same with the front light. And this is me looking for the strip lights I use for backlight. Adding them in and then using the tools available to me to make sure they're evenly distributed in straight lines. And also the psych lights. And then I remembered that I almost forgot to add in the uh, side lights. And then the last really helpful bit of information that is going to be on a light plot is called the symbol key. This is me setting mine up real quick. I know it's really quickly, but in the symbol key, it will give us pertinent information such as what gel color needs to be at the front of the light, what gobo is in the front of the light, what circuit it's plugged into, also referred to as a dimmer, and also what channel the light is. And we can see here it is also displaying how many of each light. So at the top, working our way down, it's using seven of the elation pars, elation 1000s. There are 20 of the ETC D40s, which are our top lights. There are 20 of our ETC source for 26 degrees, 10 of our ETC source for 36 degrees, the side lights, and five of our ETC source for psych lights. And it's good that it's showing us how many we're using so that if we were coming into a theater with a light plot and there were no lights currently hung, we will know how many of each light we need to go gather. And also we can use this to compare against our inventories to make sure we're not trying to use more than what's available to us. Now for one last thing, how we craft a look or a cue, but not in the technical sense. We've already looked at how on the ION we set levels of lights and their colors if they're LED, but what we haven't talked about is how we should craft a cue. Some of the best advice I found in a book was work from the background to the foreground, which means that to create a look with depth, good composition, and directs the audience's eye well, in other words, one that satisfies all of the functions of lighting and theater, you should establish the world first through color and texture, lighting the area around the actors from above and behind with the light getting dimmer as it moves away from the center of focus. Next, we should light our performers to separate them as well as to make them look interesting from the background through top light and side light. Lastly, we should add front light so that it's sufficient to see the actor's face is easily, but not so bright that we lose the ambiance that we've already created. Lighting is a medium that's very easy to do too much with, so it's a good thing to keep in mind that we should only use as much as we need so that we don't lose visual focus, lose our composition, or light things that are meant to be hidden in the wings or offstage. One last note on creating a lighting cue. Our vision and visual acuity, or the ability to distinguish one thing from another, are based on five factors. Contrast, or the degree of difference between two surfaces. Brightness, or how much light something is reflecting. Size, which is how big something is in our field or view, and the fact that small things will need more light when far away. Time, or how long do we have to look at something before either the lighting changes or it leaves your field of view. And lastly, color, especially in that our eyes focus better in warm tones like reds and yellows and ambers.